So we now know the definition of discrete time convolution. We've been writing that summation down a lot. We've worked through some of the properties of discrete time convolution. We know that it's associative, that it's distributive. We know what happens when we convolve with an impulse. We know the width property, lots of different properties of it. What we want to start doing now is getting some practice in actually evaluating the convolution sum. And remember, the reason this is an important thing is because the convolution sum relates the input and output of a discrete time linear time invariant system. So if I know the impulse response of the system and you tell me the input, I can compute the output using the convolution sum. So what we're going to start doing is practicing evaluating this summation. So the first thing we want to do is just do a simple example where we have very short signals where we can just explicitly evaluate the convolution sum on a term-by-term -term basis. So let's start off with a really simple example. So let's think about the, the following signals. Let's let f of k be this signal. So on the time axis, I'm going to plot it. And it's basically zero almost everywhere. It's zero everywhere except for at time k minus 1, it's equal to 2. And at k minus 2, it's equal to 2. And let's also consider the signal g of k. And similarly, it's zero almost everywhere except it is non-zero at time 2 and 3. At time 2, it's equal to 2 and at time 3 it is equal to 1. So these are very simple signals that we're going to deal with just to get some practice with evaluating the discrete time convolution sum. Obviously what we're asked to do here is to compute their convolution. So let's compute f convolved with g and we're going to call that signal h. So some things that we know how to do. We know how to compute the starting points and stopping points for h. We know that h will be 0 almost everywhere on the time axis except for some finite set of points. So let's go ahead and compute those ranges of points that we're going to need to be concerned about. The starting point we can get by adding up the starting point of each signal. So f starts at minus 2 and signal g starts at positive 2. So minus 2 plus 2 gives us 0. So h of k is going to start at 0. Similarly, its stopping point will be minus 1, the starting point, the stopping point for f, and 3, the stopping point for g. So if I add those up, I get 2. So the last point that I will need to compute for h of k is at time k equals 2. <clears throat> so I now know that h of k is 0 for any times less than the start point or greater than the stopping point. So the only points I need to consider are 0, 1, and 2. So we need to evaluate h of k, which by definition is this summation, but I don't need to worry about computing it for all time k because we just figured out where on the time axis we need to compute this thing. I only need to compute it for times 0, 1, and 2. Also, instead of an infinite sum, let's look at the signal f. f only exists, it's only non-zero for times minus 2 and minus 1. So the counter variable here in our discrete time sum m equals minus infinity to infinity, I can really actually just right away replace that with minus 2 to minus 1 because f is just f of m. It's just counting over the time variable m. For any other values of m, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., f at those times is 0, so all those terms are 0. So I've not changed anything here. I've just taken into account the fact that f is 0 almost everywhere on the time axis to kind of simplify this infinite summation. <coughs> So I need to evaluate this for k equals 0, 1, and 2. So let's go ahead and do k equals 0. So if I replace k with 0, my summation is now this. So all the k's are replaced with 0. So I can write that as f of m times g of minus m. And I can actually just go ahead and write out these terms. There's only two terms in this sum. The m equals minus 2 term and the m equals minus 1 term. So that's f at time minus 2 times g of 2 plus f at times minus 1 times g of 1. f at minus 2 is equal to 2. g at time 2 is equal to 2, so that's 2 times 2, plus at time minus 1, the signal f is equal to 2, and at time plus 1, the signal g is equal to 0. So this turns out to be 4. So I've now computed one of the samples that I need for h. h at time 0 is equal to 4. I'm going to do similar things for k equal 1. For k equals 1, I take the sum from the previous slide and I replace all the k's with 1. So all the k's have been replaced with 1. So I can write this out really as the sum of two different pieces. 
the m equals minus 2 term. So when m is equal to minus 2, I have f of minus 2. g of 1 minus minus 2 is 1 plus 2, or 3, plus the next part is f of minus 1 times g of 2. Notice one thing that happens. Anytime we do the summation, right now I'm computing h of 1. If I look at each term here, the sum of the indices always sum to 1. So look at that, f of minus 2 times g of positive 3. 3 plus a negative 2 is 1, so they always sum up to 1. Same thing for the next term, f of minus 1 plus g of 2. 2 plus a negative 1 is 1. So those, those always add up to 1 because I'm computing h of 1. The same thing happened when we computed h of 0. All of the arguments summed to 0. So the first term, back in the k equals 0 section, I had f of minus 2 times g of positive 2. 2 plus a negative 2 is 0. The next term in that sum was f of minus 1 times g of 1. 1 plus a negative 1 is 0. So there's always this nice symmetry in that every single term in the convolution sum, if you add up the arguments of the signals, they should always equal the index on the left that you're computing. So that's always just a good check to make sure you're doing things right. So we can go ahead and substitute in the exact values for these signals, 2 times 1 plus 2 times 2. That gives me 6. So I now know that h times 1 is equal to 6. And then finally, for k equals 2, I have h of 2 is equal to the sum from minus 2 to 1, f of m, g of 2 minus m. I've replaced all the k's with 2. I can write this out as the sum of two different terms again, f of minus 2 times g of 4. Again, note that 4 plus a negative 2 is 2. They add up to 2 because I'm computing h of 2. Plus the next term is f of minus 1 times g of 3. Again, 3 plus a negative 1 is 2. They add up to 2 because I'm computing h of 2. If I substitute in the values for the signals, f at minus 2 is equal to 2, g of 4 is 0. f of negative 1 is 2, and g of 3 is equal to 1. So this is equal to 2. So I now know that at time 0, h is equal to 4. At time 1, h is equal to 6. And at time 2, h is equal to 2. And at 0, everywhere else. So if I wanted to, I could go ahead and plot h. So here's the time axis. It's 0 everywhere except at 0, it's equal to 4. At 1, it's equal to 6. At 2, it's equal to 2. And then at 0, everywhere else. So this was just a simple example showing you how to evaluate the discrete time convolution summation when you're dealing with signals that are very short. And if you're dealing with signals that are very short with only a few samples, just explicitly plugging into the summation like this is actually a very straightforward and easy thing to do.